And welcome everyone. I can see a lot of uh, really familiar faces and I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. Um, as many of you might know, um, this is actually a part of a larger program called Dataset Match, which is a year-long um, event that we're hosting looking at the kind of um, cultural and political questions that the image data set presents us. Uh, and this is in itself um, a long time in the making, actually. We've been working on these issues for um, about six years now in the digital program. And in 2015, we um, developed a partnership with the Centre for the Study of the Networked Image uh, and uh, developed a collaborative PhD looking at questions of curating ubiquity uh, and we did an open call on that and um, we recruited uh, Nicholas Malave, who is our second speaker, who will be talking about the research he's been doing looking at um, image data sets and the politics of um, their creation and uh, mobilization in digital culture. Um, and uh, I think uh, I'll tell you a bit more about the program, but first I thought, given that um, we're all here today to talk about data sets, it might make sense to propose a kind of definition which is commonly used in the computer sciences. Um, a data set in computer vision is a collection of digital photographs that developers use to train, test, and evaluate the performance of their algorithms. Once assembled and packaged, a common set of photographs is shared amongst computer scientists and using the same data set gives the possi possibility to, to different developers to compare their work. So I guess um, to us this is really, really um, a crucial moment to think about photography uh, in relation to the meaning of images. Who are the active agents um, involved in the kind of uh, understanding of how images work, where they are, what are the blind spots. And it's very crucial for us to bring together, um, move across not just the context of art, photography and visual culture, but also to think about um, computational culture, the work of computer scientists, um, and as, uh, as other agents to begin to talk, to bring into the history of photography and really begin to understand their practices. And one of the key figures that um, overshadow uh, the data set that we'll be um, talking a bit about today is Professor, oh sorry, Dr. Fei Fei Li um, of Stanford University, um, who is really uh, a really fascinating um, person who we've done, we've already been um, doing a lot of work looking, uh, well Nicola will tell you about his work, um, looking at her scientific contributions. She, um, she, she uh, gave birth to one of the most signif significant image um, data sets uh, 10 years ago, ImageNet, and um, we'll be talking a bit about that in a moment. But um, what would it mean to begin to sort of talk about these collections of images as really significant cultural artifacts, these people as authors? And with that in mind, we'll be, um, she will be coming here next week on Saturday to give a talk about ImageNet, and we'll be throwing uh, a birthday party for ImageNet, which you're all welcome to come to, in which there will be some exciting um, party games and um, subversively playful activities. So I will flash up at the end um, that activity uh, to encourage you to come. But I guess this question of um, the photograph becomes pressing. Um, whilst there's been a lot of attention in about, uh, about algorithms themselves, it's almost been mystified and we haven't really begun to talk about the significance of the data that they are trained on, which is usually digital photographs. And, um, and Fei Fei Li was really significant because she recognised this in her research. She realised that you know, the optimization of algorithms will only get you so far, so far. And by looking at the world through her child's eyes, she began to realise that um, as a, if a child sees, you know, 50 million images by the age of three, you know, how, how can she improve the data on which uh, machines are trained? And this is quite significant. Um, if you begin to look at this example, uh, courtesy of Jeff Cox here and Nicola, in which... Um, the same machine vision algorithm trained on two different data sets 
is asked to recognise objects in John Berger's BBC programme, Ways of Seeing. So you can begin to see differences in the way um, objects are recognised. I think I remember Jeff and Nicola saying that um, cocoa uh, is very much a product of a kind of um, context of a kind of Silicon Valley American kind of context where when people are holding things, it thinks it's a burrito or... <laughs> and other sorts of glitches that come through, but Nicola can, can expand on that. Um, and I thought it might uh, be worthwhile look, looking at one of the most earliest image data sets. Um, this is from a paper from 1976, in which David Ma reveals um, the six images he chose to describe the world in order to um, begin to optimise um, uh, his early um, work in machine vision. So this problem of how to represent the world um, becomes encoded into uh, a history of image data sets. Um, and this is a, a beautiful slide from a presentation by Fei Fei Li, who I mentioned before, in which it is a kind of literature review of the history of, um, of these data sets. And like, there is an absolutely fascinating history to how these um, are developed and um, accumulated. And I think some of you who, who applied to our open call around image data sets got to see things like the, uh, when the Epic Kitchen data set, which is a load of videos uh, of people moving around a kitchen to help with certain forms of vision and other um, kinds of strange um, configurations. Um, and of course, uh, this is another early um, image data set, Labeled Faces in the Wild. Uh, I love this, the title of this, because it's this sense of like, if you go to the internet, rather than photographing the guys in your lab for your facial vision data set, that there is some kind of, you know, it's almost like the photographer in, on the safari trying to find images for the data set that almost, um, uh, and the sense of that, that this is a site where images just appear and they're not, um, they're not a problem in a way. They're kind of away from the bias and you escape the bias by scraping things off the internet, which is a really, really interesting um, perspective if we think about um, architectures of the web and uh, how these images come, which Nicola will be talking about in a moment. Um, and, and, and here's Fei Fei's um, another imi uh, image from one of her slides. Um, the sense that this, will tr this actually will trigger a breakthrough in artificial intelligence. And when she talks about ImageNet, which is 14 million images that she created um, at Stanford, <coughs> there is a sense that um, there is a sense that this is almost a surprise that actually in the end we've seen, I'll just move to this in. Um, an explosion of data sets um, it triggered and also huge um, advances in neural networks and other kinds of older computational technologies which had kind of been put aside which have now come back into play um, if we think about um, uh, everything from deep fakes and, and those sorts of controversies. So, um, of course, why is this important to photography? It's really interesting when you look at the literature, there is, there is a real problem here that we're really interested in exploring at the Photographer's Gallery because for the computer scientists, the photographic image is a kind of um, neutral uh, space of pattern and noise, in a way. It's, it's, it's a transparent medium, in a way. And there isn't a kind of sense of a longer kind of historical... Um, context for the photograph. And here we have um, the, the classic example that everyone talks about in machine vision uh, and facial recognition, uh, Francis Galton's work um, in the 1800s looking at um, forms of criminality and his work trying to create typologies through photography of 
the insane, the criminal, um, and different kinds of social classes. And of course, this uh, again informed um, research in genetics, um, which is now um, quite discredited. But again, we see re-emerging in kinds of uh, questions around um, facial uh, recognition, which Heather will be um, talking about in her work. And then, of course, the problem of if the data set is the site where you can kind of optimise your machine vision um, system, how, you know, the actual task of collecting and labelling all those images is a huge, huge problem. So if you remember the Google, um, the Google Arts and Culture selfie app, everyone's like taking selfies, going, this is great, and then people are going, hey, you're giving away your bi biometric data here. Um, this is actually a really cheap way of Google getting a huge facial uh, image data set linked to real people in the world. Um, have you not thought about that? And you'll see like all the kinds of questions about the um, other photo apps that have come where you're, photo you're comparing yourself um, for with photographs when you're old and young and how, does that, um, how can that be used or scraped in order to uh, train. And then we have um, all these other questions about copyright. How do people feel about being included in these data sets? Um, which are some of the kinds of discourses uh, appearing. But I'm going to, um, in a moment, hand over to Nicola. Um, but before I do, I thought we'd just um, pause for a moment to think about ImageNet, um, the data set that we've been exhibiting on the media wall downstairs for the last two months. Um, 14 million images, uh, it, its website is here. And you can, um, uh, it's uh, 14 million images that have been generated against another kind of structure called WordNet. Uh, and it, it, it scrapes images, often from Flickr, in, into these kinds of categories. And you can begin to sort of see on the ImageNet um, website how these um, categories begin uh, through words and then they're mapped onto images. <coughs> so in again, there is this kind of um, humanities endless problem of the image language game. As we might see, uh, this is a synset on a dog. So what ImageNet does is it will take a word uh, and begin to collect lots of images around that word to get a kind of essence of what that word or, uh, might mean as a representation. Toolbox. It's a bit conceptual art in a way. Yeah. Bannister. And then um, bath. And I'm particularly fond of this guy down here in the bath covered with Nintendo <laughs> controllers. Um. Um, yeah, so w when we were thinking about this, we were wondering, well, w what would it mean for a photography institution to exhibit this kind of data set and really recognise this as a kind of cultural form that we need to be looking at and interrogating. And of course, the space of the museum is really fetishising the discrete, in-framed, printed image. So we have a media wall, so why don't we explore what that meant? And actually, that created a huge amount of problems, both in the order, like, how to actually find bits of the database that have mysteriously disappeared off, offline, and also the kinds of computational power we need to think about to show Two, like to show 14 million images took us two months at about 90 milliseconds per image. Um, and uh, there were some quite surprises for us um, as certain kinds of synsets appeared on the screen at huge scale. Because um, you can imagine every sphere of life is represented um, here. Um, uh, and I just sort of wanted to, before I hand over to Nicola to do the deep dive, um, sort of mention um, you can read more about some of the work we've been doing on our website, Unthinking Photography, um, in which Nicola dissects uh, Fei Fei Li's uh, TED Talk forensically on uh, her creation image net, and um, Jeff Cox's uh, text, Ways of Machine Seeing, um, from 2016, the most downloaded um, article on the website. And uh, a reminder of the date next week, 21st of September, 4 till 7 p.m. Please join us. It's such, I cannot believe that Fei Fei Li is actually going to come here. 
and give a talk. I mean, so we need an audience. We need... <laughs> Um, because for her, actually, it's quite interesting. For her, you know, she was really an outsider in um, computing science and, and was really, um, put, you know, putting her work on the line. She put, put ImageNet was originally a poster presentation that everyone ignored. Um, and now, of course, she's done secondments to Google, um, quite controversial um, with Project Maven, um, contro controversies. And it's a really great opportunity to begin to um, bring those voices into the gallery and also look at what it would mean to, to unpack it playfully.